on the D ring, ready to pull the parachute. <laughs> if anything goes wrong, we're all in this together. So, <laughs> <laughs> is this the right channel? Am I on the right channel? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I want to welcome everyone today um, to a critical conversation, um, a multidisciplinary project on the interconnection of art, race, privilege, and place. And today we are having panelists with us. Um, my English name is Beth Robinson. My Lenape name is Apakamux Asasa Anase. Um, I'm one of your facilitators today. I hold a master's degree in dispute resolution with a focus in grief and intergenerational grief and conflict. My day job is the paper conservator at the Jordan Snitzer Museum. And by God, I'm an incredible dog walker. My co-facilitator today is Megan Malone. She also holds two master's degree, one in conflict dispute resolution, the other in education. She is currently working on getting licensed in social work and works at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health as a learning specialist. She has three cats that can Zoom meeting with us today. One will be Jet, Olive, and Pam. I'd like to begin our, our panel with honoring the native peoples and the lands that we are on. Currently, the show and I are in the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapu Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation of Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederate tribes of Grand Ron community of Oregon and the Confederate tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon and continue to make important contributions to their communities as well as ours. And across the land we now refer to as Oregon. We express our respect for all federally recognized tribal nations of Oregon. This includes the Burns Paiute tribe, the Confederate tribe of Coos, Lower Umqua, and Sayusla Indians, the Confederate tribes of the Grand Ronde community of Oregon, the Confederate tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon, the Confederate tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation and the Confederate tribes of Warm Springs and the Cayucla, I always say that one wrong, I'm so sorry, Indian tribe and the Cow Creek Band of Umqua tribe of Indians and the Klamath tribes. We also express our respect for all other displaced Indian, indigenous peoples who call Oregon home and in the lands any of our panelists currently re reside, such as the Ho-Chuck in Madison, and my very own affiliated people, the Lenape in Delaware. So thank you, panelists. And Megan's gonna take us out. Um, I would love if you each could spend some time introducing yourselves uh, so that the audience gets to hear a little bit about you, you know, share what you wanna share. Um, and then after that point, we'll just kind of jump on in. Um, I do wanna iterate Beth's comment. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm excited to listen to the three of you chat and you know, riff off of each other. It's already been great. So I'm just excited to see that going. Um, share what you want to share. Um, and we'll just go from there. All right. It's, uh, I'd like to actually give it over to Carter uh, if you'd like to go first. Carter, you're on mute. Hey, there you go. Perfect. It's so good to be here today. And um, speak with you all. I'm so excited. My name's Carter McKenzie. Uh, she, her, hers. I live in Dexter, Oregon, just southeast of Eugene. Um, I'm a poet and I teach poetry sessions um, and I am a member of Springfield Eugene Surge showing up for ra racial justice, which um, we started in 2015. And it's a it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you, Carter. 
Greg, would you like to introduce yourself next? Yeah, sure. <laughs> my name is my name is Greg Black. Is am are what were what was were be being been all of those. That that's who I am. Um, I'm a I'm an artist in terms of a I'm a filmmaker and I'm also a musician. Um, so my other backgrounds, my other half of my brain is I'm a tech freak. I'm an electrician, I'm a thermal image guy. Uh, I write computer programs for automation controls, you know, so um, I try to use all of the uh, brain matter that I have, but there's still some parts of it that are still pink, just like a newborn baby. And so I like to kind of um, explore and, 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 and see those things. I'm just a very curious person. And so I think that's how I got into all the stuff I'm in is that I'm extremely curious and uh, my phone's ringing. Gotta have more sharks. <laughs> Gotta have more sharks. Um, so it, it is just a pleasure and honor to uh, be here to, to talk about what art means to, to this community or what art means to me and to be able to, to be expressive about it and to be immersed into that uh, particular genre, whether it is film or music or photography. Um, um, I think I'm both visual and auditory at the same time. So I, I, that has just been the drug of choice. Well, that's two choices, right? So those are the, those are the two op opioids that I tend to, to navigate toward. And I, I try to be a part of it and try to, as best I can, uh, honor those those artistic venues and try to add something, whatever it is, to to make it respectful, so that people come away with some idea of the discipline of what it takes to be um, immersed in that culture. And it's about being immersed in it and being curious. Thank you, Greg. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Thanks, man. My name's uh, Eric. Richardson, uh, even though I have my NAACP banner behind me, uh, we're just practicing for the Freedom Fund dinner. Uh, I'm really in this conversation, uh, you know, just as plain old Eric, <laughs> uh, who literally was born into a family of, uh, of African-American uh, strivers in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, who uh, living there, uh, my mom and dad married in 67, uh, and, and they, at that time, they were uh, both part of a, a group there called the Black Artist Group, uh, otherwise known as BAG. And there's been a, a book or two written about it, uh, but it was a collaborative effort of dancers, poets, musicians, and really who were looking at uh, redefining art and ourselves through our art uh, as Black people. Uh, and, and this is coming after and during the civil rights movement and, uh, uh, you know, uh, assassination of Malcolm. Uh, all these things uh, were pertinent. And, uh, and, and in our family, uh, one of the great uh, heroes, uh, really above MLK, <laughs> uh, was John Coltrane. Uh, and because we're, no one ever said that the word would come in English. No one even said it would come in words like that, and that it. But because we hear many on many levels, we can feel. And so, uh, uh, John Coltrane music is a literature of the black people in America that should be studied and understood in, in such ways. And so, anyway, I was brought up with a kind of an intellectual uh, uh, look and understanding artistic understanding and striving with from that is in the black community, but is oftentimes overlooked uh, and, and, and sometimes um, oppressed <laughs> uh, because it is not the narrative uh, that one would want to see uh, thrive. It's pan-African. It, it tries to see the connections between black people all over the globe because there's a pan-African diaspora. And, it, and, and, with, and the music, different aspects of the music and the art was taken with the people and refined in different places of the globe. And so we're all connected. Uh, and so it's about in 2021, not only should we enjoy 
some of these other things that exist, but those connections. But anyway, that's it. Uh, I'm here in Eugene to raise some family, uh, bait play the upright bass a little bit. My dad was a bassist. Uh, I played the bass, but I, I'm amateur. You know, I think more than anything, it's just about love of culture and identity and trying to have agency. Thank you. Um, I appreciate all of you being here. Um, just to give the audience a little bit of context, we have had, Beth and I have had the opportunity to meet with most of you. And so these questions um, in a lot of ways are a continuation of the dialogue that we had prior to that. So um, please feel free to share what you wanna share or ask each other questions. Um, Beth and I are here to just facilitate kind of the flow, but I think the three of you already have, a, I mean, obviously have a great connection. So I'm excited to see that. Um, but I'll just jump right in. Um, you each mentioned poetry, being musicians and using that space, I think for, you know, identity, uh, connection, cultural connections, you know, I think we use those mediums as just various forces to thrive in. And I was wondering what you could talk about, if you could talk about how this type of art for you um, holds you accountable and how you help other people be held accountable in terms of racial justice and advocacy and what that looks like for each of you. Carter. You know, um, poetry, which I've been working on consciously as a craft since I was in my 20s, holds me accountable through its demand for accuracy of naming. And the, I, I, I wanted to share some lines from a poem by a poet who had and has quite a, a strong impact on me. And I had never heard of Adrian Rich until I was in my later 20s when I started to really write poetry seriously. And the first book of hers that I got was A Wild Patience Has Taken Me This Far. And I just wanna read lines from her poem, which is included in this book. Uh, the poem is called Integrity. And these lines, when I first read them, became the challenge and the permission and that compelled me in my work and still do in the work of accuracy. Anger and tenderness, my cells, and now I can believe they breathe in me as angels, not polarities. Anger and tenderness, the spider's genius to spin and weave in the same action from her own body anywhere, even from a broken web. So her work taught me how poetry and politics and social situations are all interconnected, as opposed to how I had been raised to think of poetry as this precious thing sort of set aside not to do with, with uh, the lived experience in a sense, um, which was according to the dominant culture, you know, that defined art. And this, this engagement of Adrian Rich energized me from the very beginning because I am drawn to poetry as poetry of witness. For me, poetry is witness, it is prayer, and it comes from the broken webs, whatever they may be, it, and it demands accuracy. And so as I became involved, when my life changed was in 2015, which was the time when we began the surge chapter and Charleston, the Charleston massacre had occurred. And it was then that I realized as a white person, the reality of systemic racism and also the reality of implicit racism that not only was it systemic out in, around me, but that I had been conditioned 
by this racism. And I had not recognized this before, though I had tried to grapple with racism before in poetry. I had always thought it was regional or individual and binary. Like the good white people are not racist and the bad white people are the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand that invisible sphere through which white supremacy is particularly toxic. And so that caused the demand for accuracy to be even more transformative. And the poetry I write, or attempt to write, and the poetry I read as well. So that the poets who changed my life are Claudia Rankin, her book of prose poetry, Citizen and an American Lyric. Denise Smith, his, their powerful book of poetry, Don't Call Us Dead. Patricia Smith, Incendiary Art. All of that is just, that holds me accountable too. So I feel, I feel that um, it's a continuation of what I, I knew was a life force in poetry, which is that it is part of that which connects us, not in isolation from what is lived, but very much through it and naming the truth, because there is no worse distortion than racism. There is no worse lie. So I feel like that is my calling very specifically now, because my experience of the world is different now and myself in the world. And that if I am not actively disrupting and dismantling racism, then the racism within me, which exists not because I chose it, but because I was conditioned by it, remains active in ways that I don't even realize. So this, this is interwoven with my poetry. It's not separate from it. So that's the accountability. Nice. nice. Very nice. Uh, uh, I mean, we're, yeah, you got it, Greg? No, uh, it's on you, Eric. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> No, uh, no, the accountability, is, it just seems that, you know, I appreciate everything you said because it is uh, what the art is a reflection of the world we live in one way or another, you know, uh, and then how, how we interact with it, how we make sense of it, uh, whatnot, and, what, and then there's higher forms, uh, and I think that Carter's really talking about that, higher forms, and, it, and it's really, we have capacity, I think, uh, to do more analysis, more you know, deeper thinking, uh, take on more uh, understanding. And, and um, one of the things that Carter kind of brought up to me was this whole idea of conditioning. Um, you know, really black people, we have been conditioned physically, whipping, <laughs> you know, the, the separation of the people, you know, telling, putting darker folks in the field, lighter folks in the house conditioning and so this is this whole thing and, and right our children those same children white children conditioned to say your your black child child is not actually your friend but your slave that that they, these things and then and then for that to so we are all not just white folks under the conditioned or being conditioned by it this is the condition that we are born into. And we all have an obligation to move us forward like in an evolutionary type of way of our thinking, because this is about evolution. If you wanna talk about the human species. And so art and all these things can bring you to science and can bring you to let's, let's talk about what it is we're actually talking about here. And what and, and, and we and art is really trying to do that because it, it, it crosses the bounds of physicality. And don't doesn't the human soul cross those bounds or does it not? Is that an argument? Or does the First Amendment right say that uh, I can argue there's no soul and in public schools? 
or I can argue that, you know, so certain, what, what are we, so when Martin Luther King, when he was talking about the soul, is that, is that just, a, you know, we can just say, believe it or not. And if you don't believe in the soul, then all that don't matter anyway. So, so I just, so what is it um, that we're, you know, as human beings, what are we trying to get at? <laughs> what are we talking about? What are we passing on to our children? Um, and I think we've been thinking about these things uh, in a very deep manner for thousands of years. We have sacred books. We have inscriptions. We have monuments uh, that, due to white supremacy, have not been given their full breadth of, of, of reality and agency of what they mean. Just like our women haven't been given their full power. You know, we're getting along with 75% on a dollar power. So we have to, you know, let's work. So there's, so this whole thing is important. But anyway, so I think it is, it is that relationship. So thank you. I guess it's my turn. So, you know, art to me, uh, all of it imitates life. And as bad as COVID has been, it has shown the cracks in, uh, in, in the American society. And uh, a friend of mine sent me a cartoon this morning, and I'm, I'm going to share it with you. The cartoon basically what says, can a racist have black friends? And the answer is yes, in the same way that a serial killer still have friends that are alive. Think about that for a minute. So, so with that, art for me is an imitation of life or the other way around. And I think what art does, whether it's music or poetry or whatever it does, it allows you to get into your own emotions. It allows you to look at your own curiosity of why that exists. And you have to have a connection with the people that are looking or listening to your artwork because now you have a communication and a communication is emotional. And once that human condition is recognized, you're able to get in and be able to say something, whether, like Eric said, whether it's uh, actual verbal or whether it's nonverbal, you're able to get in. So I challenge everybody here that you might have heard a piece of music when you were in high school or whatever, and you hear it now, and immediately you go back to that. You knew what you were doing when you heard that music. You know, you might have been riding in the convertible, the top was down, and you know, you're hanging out with your friends, and you're like, even your nods, man, you remember this jam? Yeah, man. And so that same emotion comes back. And so it is that empathy, that emotion, that art and music reaches beyond words and beyond beyond words and, and, and gets into a, a spiritual, and I say spiritual, not religious, but spiritual connection. And I think music and art put you in those spiritual connections. And whether you believe in God or higher powers, or whatever, there's still that spiritual connection. And for me, the spiritual connection is realizing that when we play music, I connect to all of those musicians who have come before me, whether you were classical, whether you were country music, whether you were gospel, whether you were blues, whatever you had, there was something about that music that has given me a, a platform that I can say, oh, hey, let me borrow that just for this moment because I'm creating, I'm improvising right now and I heard something and let me play that right now. I'll play it in my way, but you'll recognize and go, oh, hey, you got a little flavor of uh, some, some blues going on. Yeah, you got to have the blues up in here. If you ain't got the blues, ain't nothing happening, you know? And in every blues song that I have ever either paid attention to, there is always some sense of there is silver lining, even though, you know, uh, my wife left me, the dog left me, you know, all of that, there's some place in that song where there's a, a moment that up, uplifts your spirit. And that to me is what the whole connection is, is to be able to transcend all of the craziness and reach in and say, it ain't all that bad. There's always hope. Never give up hope. Mm 
And that, that to me is what is what it does. And that's what we do. That's what we try to do is pass that on in whatever way, shape or form we can. You know, we are um, beings and we need to make those connections to other people. That's the human condition. That's what it's all about. Uh, that's I, uh, inspiring. I really appreciate that because I think one of the things that I even get tripped up on when I'm navigating various spaces, I mean, higher ed is probably one of the, frankly, the whitest spaces that exists in this world, right? You have to uphold the rules and things like that. But each of you kind of touched on this of, um, you know, Carter, you talked about a box, right? Poetry is supposed to be a box, but for marginalized communities, it's an act of resistance, music, the blues, jazz, an act of resistance, right? So, so my question or my thoughts are, how do we hold shared meaning without appropriation, right? Because appropriation is that taking away that box, creating that box. But you, uh, Eric and Greg, you're talking about sharing, that soul sharing, right? That's really important to heal each other, but I also think to heal the community. Mm -hmm. So if you could each kind of talk on that level of accountability, where it's like, let's honor the history, let's honor the experience and maybe break down that box, but without hurting other people mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. oh. um, well, I, I feel, I so love what Greg and Eric shared. It's very inspiring. And the connection is the point. It is the point. Um, in thinking about appropriation as a white person, as a white poet, uh, I, I feel that if I'm drawn to an element from another culture, I need to remember the relationship of the dominant culture I am conditioned by, even though I didn't want to be conditioned by, and the cultural elements uh, whether that culture, cultural element comes from a non-dominant culture. In other words, there's a power relationship that's historical and oppressive. You know, a pattern of oppression has been appropriation by a whiteness, by a culture of whiteness of, of uh, non-dominant cultures. And I feel as a white person, regardless whether it's poetry uh, or anything else, I must, I must be aware of that history. And then I have to, and I, I just wanna acknowledge the book that I've been reading very closely for a year now. I've gone through it four times um, in different workshops. And, uh, Me and White Supremacy, Combat Racism, Change the World and Become a Good Ancestor by Layla F. Saad. And um, she I, helped me identify the dynamics of so many things uh, regarding appropriation. And these are the questions that I have. Of course, as I write, I'm going to be inspired by different voices, for example. Um, but then if, if there's a, a, something that I were to use, maybe a poetic form, um, what is the historical relationship with, between the culture that that has um, that out of which I come and the current relationship of that culture, the dominant culture and the non-dominant culture? Um, why is it so important for me to partake of a cultural element from a non-dominant culture at the risk of offending people from that culture? That's that's one thing I really think about. Um, do I understand and respect the original cultural value of this element, considering the origin? And finally, the basic question is, am I invited? Am I invited to partake of it? If I'm not invited, I'm not going to partake of it to the best of my ability. And I'm not saying I haven't made mistakes. I have, I'm sure. But those are the things that I'm really thinking about now regarding appropriation as opposed to appreciation. It seems like, and it's always different. It's nuanced, isn't it? But, but those are the questions that are important to me because otherwise what happens is what I think of as a toxic decontextualization. 
like you take the context away because you have a whim and you like something and you decide you're going to, you know, imitate it. That's, that's appropriation to me. It's not respectful. So that's my answer, for, you know, to the best of my ability right now. That's great. Thank so you, I think I'm going to jump in here because All right. pr- appropriations, you know, I, I, I'm going to go back to music because I'm going to say, um, all music at one time was all new. Okay, it was all brand new. So appropriations come from, and I know this from classical artists, they borrow, and, and I put borrow in quotes, they borrow from each other. Sometimes they steal ideas, you know, between uh, Handel and, and, and a lot of, they all stole ideas from each other. Some of them even stole ideas from Duke Ellington, you know, because they were all in that same era they're all in that mix of, of, of writing music at that time. So they were stealing from each other. And I think it's okay to do that by doing it. But when you, when the result is I can make a dollar off of stealing this idea and then claiming it was mine without being respectful and saying, yeah, I borrowed from this. And then, you know, uh, expecting the, the feedback, um, the kickback. Carlos Santana kind of, it happened to him. You know, they would say, hey, this is Latin music. Carl said, it ain't Latin music. This is African music. And everybody that was south of Texas went, wait a minute. No, this is Mexican music. They go, nope. Where'd the drums come from? And they're like, oh, okay. That's an African thing. So Carl started jamming with West Coast African bands. And you could hardly tell the difference, you know, because it all blended together. He's like, yep. He said, this is where the music came from. So the same thing, you know, you listen to Spanish music and you go, man, you know, Spaniards, but what was the influence of of the Spaniards for that music? It was Jewish and Muslim. Those were the basis of what was happening in Spain. You know, then if you weren't a good Catholic, you got kicked out because when the Inquisition came, are you Catholic or are you something else? (laughs) You know, so you had to make up make make up your mind which one you're going to be so i look at appropriations if they're done respectfully and you you know the bottom line is i'm not trying to make a dollar bill off of you and then claim that i invented all of this because you can't invent all one person can't invent all of this stuff so it is shared some points across the planet everywhere it's shared and if you don't recognize where it came from then and you claim it was yours that to me is the boundary you claim no i invented this i invented I, i'm a guitar player and i invented circular breathing and eric's gonna laugh at me i know but, you know i'm a guitar player and i invented right. circular breathing yeah right greg <laughs> yeah. you can't spell circular breathing you know so so that's you know so and and we as humans I mean, I challenge us, we have appropriate, appropriated gene pools. I mean, who here is pure? <laughs> not near none of one of us is pure. We look through our gene pool, we be like, oh, we got some of them? I didn't know some of them. Man, how did they get over here? You know, so we got people, we have gene pools from everywhere on this planet. You know, and, and that's what it is. That's how it gets passed around. And so it is a reflection or part of that whole institution of knowing that appropriation is a shared basis. And it can be genetics, it can be music, it can be written word. Um, We know that nothing is original anymore, unless you say, yeah, I got this idea. You know, I borrowed it and you put the borrow in quotes. I borrowed this from, go, oh, okay, we get you. We understand what it is. So that's how I look at appropriations. And and that's kind of the concept that I I carry with that. As long as you're not stealing it, making that dollar bill off of it and saying that, yeah, I actually did this and me and me alone. I am the only more powerful person that ever did that. I said, now you need to sit down somewhere. (laughs) Greg is on point, you know, and, uh, and, and so you, we've kind of had like, Greg was uh, like on both sides, right? You're, You're like, well, you know, there is really not that that's not happening, but on the other hand, it can happen. And when and and the, and this is kind of the condition, 
I think the whole conversation about appropriation is because we're living in the condition we talked about earlier. You dig? Oh, we got to go to court. Uh, I'm going to make some money off of this idea. And this. Oh, well, you're appropriating it. Da, da, da. Hey, you know, people, human beings who love one another and, and share their music, they're not talking about that. And so I've got two questions that just came to mind. I was curious, do white supremacists uh, uh, approve of the cultural appropriate appropriation uh, conversation because it allows them to claim everything in the Western hemisphere? Is that, is, you know, it's cool. We like that conversation because you can't claim the, the street light. You can't claim the first open heart surgery because it's actually happened in the West and that's our stuff. You appropriated it. You just happen to be black, but you appropriated science somehow to be the first person to do the open heart surgery. I, that's not how it works. Mm -mm. One planet, mm -hmm. one human family trying to advance ourselves, mm -hmm. get to a point of excellence. And if we're not, then we're within what are we doing? We're stuck on, some, you know, uh, whatever. But the whole idea is, um, uh, yeah, that was something that came to it. And then the other thing about it, um, and, and I, I hate to be so critical, but ultimately the, the comedic people said that the first thing you got to do on, this, on your path is to know yourself. And then, and so in that regards, the whole idea of, a, of feeling like somebody is like a, a culturally appropriating my stuff when it's really as an individual, it's not yours to begin with anyway, as an individual, mm -hmm. you're gonna talk about that's my culture. But anyway, the whole idea is the sense of loss already. Oppression for hundreds of years, discrimination. I've been I've been oppressed. I've just and not only that, now you wanna, you know, not even allow me to have my culture. So I think that does drive it. It's like what is the actual feeling that is saying. You, you know, that's enough. I can't stand it. <laughs> you know, you said, you know, mm -hmm. and that would normally not be the reaction. So that means that we're talking about a, a, a physical reaction that is happening because of our mental state. Mm. And, 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 and appropriation is a, is a symptom. I mean, the argument about it is a symptom of our stress, our fed upness, you know, and all this. But ultimately, we need to heal ourselves so that is not an issue. We want to share ourselves and our music and our stories. And if we get to a place where we're not wanting to share that and you got to pay me for that or you can't even do it, then you might as you're talking the stuff Trump was talking about. Mm. And so that's where I'm at with it. Yeah. You know, one thing I do want to, uh, the way I was thinking about this and the way I understand it is there's appreciation, which is celebrating connection. And then there's white supremacist appropriation, which will pick and choose, but without valuing the culture from which those things come or without valuing the people from which those things come. That's, that's how I I'm experiencing appropriate or understanding appropriation as, as, as disrespectful, um, as, as, as that, which sort of would, would rewrite history even because, well, yeah, I mean, you know, but, but that's nothing new. I mean, you talk, no. how you talk, how are we going to talk about cultural appropriation when our physical bodies are in America? Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're talking about uh, uh, we're upset about cult and the changing of history. What? Mm -hmm. What? I mean, the hieroglyphics were deciphered in 1834, 30, in the 30s. You can't go to one major university in the United States of America and get a, a, a higher ed education on the hieroglyphics and, and their relationship to Black Africa and to Western civilization mm -hmm. to this day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes, they, they, this is not this is not like something new. This is mm -hmm, what the system yeah. has done. This yeah, is, is that that is like ground level. So let's not be too caught up in that. What we have to be caught up in is, and, and this mm -hmm. is what I understand, 
is first of all, claiming, knowing and claiming what it is we're talking about because it's already happened. All the deeper pieces mm -hmm. have already happened. Uh, this scale yeah. behind me, that is a comedic African symbol that, that, that the, the original scales. So let me, so, so it has already happened. And so mm -hmm. what we're talking about is how can we identify it through art through, and, and bring it forth without mm -hmm. being violent, without, you know, with being kind, mm -hmm. using the things that they, they, they stole and tried to use for themselves, but it's not working out because look at our climate. Yeah. Because they did not have the soul and the insight and the spirit to understand what they were using and what for the purpose. And so I th this is where I'm at. So, I mean, I just think that we just got to reclaim it and it's and all people uh, own it. Amen. And it, of, yeah, all, of all goodwill. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so without my art, without truth, justice and balance, the ship doesn't get to a safe port. Yeah. And we're trying to get our people to a safe port and anyone can catch Mm -hmm. with those principles mm -hmm. that's really thank i appreciate yeah, i'm sorry i'm being all yeah, no. upset every time it seems like lately when i get in conversations i just get more uh, no little, you know so I it's, apologize. it's one it's really really good it's good to hear those thoughts eric and greg thank you yeah sorry, i love you. it Oh, yeah. I, mean, I think, I, I think, I think, I think what's it, important. I think that's really beautiful. I mean, as a person that studies grief and does a lot with grief, you identifying it as a loss, right? And how our culture pushes people with grief and loss to the edges. Because then we have to acknowledge that grief and loss and support them in it, right? And it's way easier to pretend like it didn't happen. Sorry, Megan, I cut you on. No, I was, I'm, I would echo that. I feel, you know, I think it's both sides are coming from loss, but it's the same coin. It's that loss, grief coin, and just different perspectives, different stories on it. And we've created, the white supremacy has created that divide, right? So if we try to share that meaning, share that soul connection, we, then we get pulled back into the nuances. Well, wait, is it okay that they do it that way? Or is it okay if they do it this way? So I think, Greg, to your point, well, don't steal it. Let's share, let's share. Where does it come mm -hmm. from? Know your history, know, know your craft, right? And reclaim it in that regard. Um, and, and I think honoring who's come before. I think that's huge. I think that that's a lot of what each of this is, but I'm, I'm, I'm also still sitting in Eric, your point uh, of how to come through it, come past, move past it, right? How do we get to that healing phase of it? And I think part of it is, you know, Eric, you and Greg getting together and be like, okay, we're just going to, jam about and see what happens right that's healing to me in so many ways mm -hmm. and so i guess my thought is how do you invite people into that space yeah. uh, because i think that's also a very sacred space um and in some ways i feel like white supremacy says well i belong in that space whether or not you want me in that space mm -hmm. so how do we balance that piece of mm -hmm. this of like let's heal together and honor it at the same time mm -hmm. I'm going to say that uh, I, the, the way I view white supremacy is that it's from a point of weakness, because I want to say that, you know, as a white supremacist, I want to say that I've invented everything. I own everything. You know, uh, I had the right to take this from you. I had the right to set up an agreement with the Native Americans and then disregard that agreement because I can do that. And so that's my privilege is because uh, my skin tone tells me that I can, I'm omnipotent and I'm better than everybody else that ever walked this planet. And, you know, I say, nope, you put your pants on one leg at a time, just like everybody else. And if you don't recognize that, there is something wrong in that psychic, because why do you have to feel superior uh, in order to make yourself feel really powerful? It ain't about that. You know, so as you become a white supremacist, um, I, I'm backpedaling away from you because you're constantly going to tell me that the education system and this is this is, again, why the cracks in the covid are so awesome is because we see this United States as being all powerful with all of this and they ain't got money to get to schools. And we know that two fighter jets, the cost of two fighter jets will fund the school system for a year and a half. Why ain't we doing that? You know, uh, we're seeing 
people who can't get food and we're the United States. We can't, we can't get food. We can't get COVID vaccination delivered, but Amazon can have it on your door that next day. What's up with y'all? Well, you know, we're going to slow the mail down because we think the mail system is, 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 is over bloated. So no, you need to speed it up because there's ways to automate that to make it happen. And we're seeing all these cracks in society in America that never, that was kind of smoothed over and said, well, you know, we are all powerful. And then we see the guy behind the curtain. Don't look at the guy behind the curtain, you know? So the Wizard of Oz, are we, are we at that point? You know, that we, we we're being told, don't look at the guy behind yeah, the curtain. We had an election, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know. But you know, what I'm saying is even, even with the election and Joe Biden is he's got a, you know, look at all of this stuff and they got to look at all the the opposition that is trying to say that's too expensive. I'm going, oh, yeah, but you want to give money to other countries and you can't even take care of your own country. What is the problem with that? And I think I'm a little jaded because I rode the bullet train in Japan and I'm, I tell my friends, man, that's awesome. They go, it's old technology. And I'm going, that's because it works. <laughs> Uh, okay that's because it works and you know what was really scary is the train i was getting ready to get on pulls in at a certain time the other one going the other way pulled in at exactly the same time and i'm like oh my god these people are <laughs> dialed in they're about moving people they're not about well okay hey yeah, we'll put one in and you know you got to pay this amount of money and do this they're like uh oh, you need to get somewhere we'll get you there one guy, one, the report was that one of the uh, train operators was a minute late getting into the station. And he was about ready to commit Harry Carey because he was he was apologizing for being a minute. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> be in the States and see, and see if your train is a half hour late or 45 minutes. I'm going from here to Portland and my train is is two hours late getting from here to Portland. I could almost walk that far. And you're com and you're apologizing for being a minute late. Give yourself some give yourself a break, dude. You know, so that's what I'm saying is that America was based on trying to be supreme at some point when they took over the lands that were here and there were already people of color here. America spoke Spanish 200 years before 1619. Mm -hmm. Okay, look at St. Augustine, Florida in 1531. That's the first uh, population here. So this is what you know we we were supreme and you know no it wasn't mm. it's like there were people there were africans here there were spaniards here there was everybody from the planet was here and when the folks that came over with the supremacy ideas everybody went who are them people with eyes like fish <laughs> but so this can the so yeah and so the conversation was about how to connect right or with folks right yeah, yeah. all right no I, you, you, you cool man i mean it arises but anyway <laughs> that was my point two, I, two, I was just trying to shots. say that you know if yeah. you if you're yeah. trying to be supreme above other people yeah. that already have culture that already have music every place i've been on this planet mm -hmm. if you're not involved in the food the culture the music mm -hmm. of everybody that's there you're missing the point of being there if you come mm -hmm. there because I'm a, I'm a tourist and i'm going to do this and everybody like yeah he's a tourist but if you get involved with the people and the dance and the music and the food that's mm -hmm. where the connection is and that's mm -hmm. what it should be about and you should mm -hmm. zip your lip i'm an american no shut up <laughs> pay attention, to, so, what, yeah. pay, pay so attention that, to what everybody else is trying to get you to believe and understand pay attention to that because that music and every culture has music dance and food mm -hmm. every culture you may not like the your tiktok moves that you're doing but every culture has dance music food and certain things that they do all the time, little rituals. But every culture has that. And if you if you respect that and just sit back and observe and understand what it is, you get an understanding of that of that people. And that's what we're supposed to do. I'm not supposed to tell yeah. you I'm better than you. No. No, no. The word you used, Greg, was empathy a while back. And that is exactly what this is. 
this is the life force of art and poetry. And it's not about argument. It's about connection through empathy. And, and uh, I think that's what, what, what we're all understanding and, and celebrating, you know? And, and that sure as hell isn't white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that scares no. white supremacy is that it fact does. that empathy is because that means that you get to zip your lip and understand what is another person's perspective and that Absolutely. yours isn't more powerful than theirs is that they have a different perspective if you're not honoring somebody else's perspective um, it's like being in a building and you know there's four sides to the building everybody's looking out a different window Okay, mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you my window view is so, better than yours. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that this brings up, because I don't go back to the other question but about the white supremacy perspective, is that we, as people who, at this point, I, I believe of goodwill are a majority of folks in our nation, in our neighborhoods, uh, we are going to have to look at, the, uh, look at their perspective but not from a, like, a, we understand it, but from a perspective of analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, because if there's something wrong with the perspective and it is leading to ill health. So the analysis mm -hmm. has to be from a, a health perspective uh, for their own communities. And, and, it has, and it has to be about learning the truth about what the angst, what is the cause of the ill health. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and if it's something that can be helped, it can be helped. There's something that can't be helped, but we have to know. And then you have, before you can actually have a conversation about what it is we're talking about. And, and I'm talking about white supremacy. You can, if you're going to tackle it, I'm not talking about reacting to it or doing it. I'm talking about if you're going to engage, try to figure out what's up and be a leader or be mm -hmm. someone who's trying to move the thing forward, we're, they're going to have to ask some deeper questions. And then, but, and then one of the things um, about how we do this in the empathy piece, it was, it just brought up the idea of dark matter mm. in space. Dark mm. matter allows for the immense, <laughs> immenseness of all there is in the universe to exist. Mm. And it is empty space. So this whole idea of knowing yourself having strength within yourself. You don't lose anything because you're empty. This is Eastern philosophy, <laughs> you know, but it is human philosophy. Mm -hmm. And it is a way you, you can both be empty and full at the same mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, and, and so because we, it's, it's, you know, some might call it magic, <laughs> but it is not. <laughs> it's being human. And so this whole idea of being empty is that you allow for the other to have space and it doesn't affect you mm. because the emptiness is dark matter. It's black. It's there. It exists. It encompasses it. It doesn't need, you know what I'm saying? And so, uh, it, it, so it's, some, it's, some, it's some conceptual things. But when you talk about blackness, melanin, which, by the way, the, the whitest, the only people who don't have the same amount of melanin as everyone else are albinos. Mm -hmm. Everybody else on the planet, if you're not an albino, is born with the exact, to the very smallest measurement of melanin. The difference is how it is disp dispersed through your body, according to your evolutionary track. Science, we are all, we all walked out of Africa. There's, we don't, we haven't got even touched the conversation of art. Picasso went to West Africa and he studied and we know the rest. The thing is, that's only one little thing. And so, and it goes both ways about, you know, appropriation, if you want to call it that, because there is no thing. And like I said, I brought up the, I brought, brought up the Dalai Lama. I brought up the Eastern philosophy because without those concepts or uh, uh, considerations, we're not fully there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't go with the John Wayne version and act like you got the whole story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I, I, I'd like so, to, to yeah. piggyback on what Eric was saying is that 
you know, the dark matter, I view it as being open. You know, mm. um, it, because if you are open and most most times human beings have this thing, well, we hate what's new, but it's that struggle to get past that, to be open to at least hearing something that's not your normal uh, path of travel. Can you mm -hmm. be open to something? Now you get to evaluate it and see if it fits in with you, but just being open at the very beginning, it's, it's like when you go to an, an orchestra and everything is is quiet and you see the the director of the orchestra when he raises his hand it's so quiet in there you can hear a rat pee on cotton because everybody <laughs> everybody's waiting for that first downbeat of that music and there's that space that's there that everybody that anticipation and you're open you're like oh what is and so that's the open that i'm talking about mm -hmm, that's that mm -hmm. that you know, I, that anticipation of like something is getting ready to happen and I'm open to it. And then your whole body language changes because now you are open. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's what we have to be sometimes yeah. is that open to that, open to mm -hmm. new ideas, new concepts, hearing things, seeing things that are new. Yeah, later on you'll evaluate it. But if you're open at that very moment, mm -hmm. that speaks volumes. Yeah. Isn't that the healing power of art? Why art is essential. It's not a decorative thing. It's, it's not a, a, an accessory. It is a, an essential thing to our condition. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah I kind of feel, I kind of feel sorry for people who don't have art, you know, you know, I, you know, COVID's like, oh, I was boxed in the house and, and I couldn't get out. I couldn't do this. And, you know, and I think the artists are like, some of us are wood shedding. Some of us are like, yeah. I you can leave me at home as long as you want. <laughs> you, you could put me in a cave with a bunch of rocks and I'm cool. <laughs> and then come back about a year later. So what's he yeah. doing? Uh, he done built some sculptures in there with yeah. the rocks, man. Exactly. You know, so that's, you know, and something like you people really, people who miss art, who are not artists or who are not open to, ex, you know, bringing their brain into a whole new perspective. Of, of just being curious. I think it's curious. Mm -hmm, it you're is. curious about a whole bunch of stuff. You're like, oh, I wonder how that works. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, and, and, and I think you go to an art at... museum, you do the same thing. You walk in and you're open when you walk up to a piece of art and you go, oh, I, I wonder where did he get that idea? Yeah. That's when you know you're curious. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I was just I thinking about there. the connection there, between. Uh, and this... I, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. ahead. I'm so sorry, Eric. Megan no. and I spent a lot of money for a law school degree to learn to be curious. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, it was I just could have appropriated of, that money. <laughs> you know. So yeah, as we go forward, you know, the idea of, of gardening, of of of, uh, of of cooking, you know, these things are still that same thing. Is that interaction? And both of those things you share as well. You know, so it's really that art, that sharing, that creativity with our hands, you know, and uh, I think the more we, we kind of give those things to our children at a young age, it does help them to when they are under stress, such as these times, to cope, you know, so we don't want to hold those secrets to ourselves. We need to get the educators to get it out there to the kids, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. And all things that are making, the work of making, like gardening and cooking and yes. music and dancing and all of that is, is what we need as humans. It's, it's not hierarchical. Well, I challenge all of the artists that are listening today is that when your hands are busy, your mind isn't because you're thinking of something else. You know, so my wife often, you know, we have a dishwasher. It works just fine. But once in a while, when I'm washing dishes, she's going, Hey, what are you thinking about? I said, well, I got mm. to smell my idea. You know, when my hands are busy, that frees the mind up to do some other mm -hmm. things or to mm -hmm. explore some of the concepts, hmm. you know? So once in a while, I try to wash dishes by hand. She goes, well, go ahead, put them in a dishwasher. I said, I already washed, you know, and now I got my ideas and I got a pencil piece of paper right next to the sink. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> um. Well, I want to really, I wish we could continue chatting. Um, I think we could talk for a long time, but I want to be respectful of your time and the audience's time. Um, I would love, I think Beth and I would both appreciate if you just have one last 
piece of advice, idea, joke, I don't know, whatever you would like to share, but just one last closing thought would be pretty awesome. Um, and, you know, and we'll close it out that way. Okay. Well, I, one of my other favorite poets is Muriel Rukeyser. And um, this very much has to do with connection and empathy. So I was inspired to share it now because of Greg and Eric. This is from Muriel Rukeyser. I cannot say what poetry is. I know that our sufferings and our concentrated joy are states of plunging far and dark and turning to come back to the world. All are here. And there is an exchange here in which our lives are met and created. So that, that I was inspired to share from Greg and Eric. Yeah. I think that was pretty good. I don't really have anything else to say behind that. That was really nice. That, uh -oh. that fit in. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> All right, Eric. All right. Yeah. Hey, yeah, man. Hopefully Sunday's we gonna, gonna get, be we good, gonna man. At this Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Sunday's gonna be good, yeah. man. You can just phone me in if you want, so I can just <laughs> listen. <Yeah>. Please, <laughs> please, please do. It'll be a fundraiser yeah. supporting the Wild Hall. I guess next month they're gonna come out online. So nice, yeah. nice. I like it. I also wanted to say I'm I'm super sorry that we can't share bread together, that we can't send anything else together at this moment, and yet we still were able to share this time together. Um, I think that's one of Megan's and my biggest regrets at this moment is that we weren't able to, you know, break bread together. Well, soon we. We hope to uh, to do something. If you get a chance, uh, I would just encourage folks to go out to uh, 255 Maxwell Road and check out the Annie Mims Community Garden. Mm -hmm. There's free uh, produce out there. You can just glean from the garden. We're hoping to get a lot of people out there. And Breaking Bread, we hope to do an event April 24th, and it'll be actual. We want to feed folks from that community garden. So That's look awesome. forward to that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. What a pleasure. What a pleasure. Thank you so much, you all. Nice meeting you. Yeah, wonderful to well. meet you. Yeah, thank you, thank yeah. you guys right, so Carter. much. And thank you for <laughs> contemporary see today. You. Yeah. You're giving right. us this space. And Megan, my great and fabulous, awesome <laughs> person, collaborator, and facilitator, yeah. and you panelists, without without the three of you this day, the, these, this hour wouldn't have been so enlightening. And Greg, Greg, when we met you, you talked about being an onion. And I think, <laughs> I think uh, you know, that we dig down in these multiple layers to have these critical conversations about things to get to healing, right? Like I said, my focus is grief and I'm always trying to get people to be more authentic, to get to the heart so that we can, you know, deal with our losses and heal. Yes, thank you, Beth. Thank you, everyone. Y'all right, take thank care. You. All right. Have a good okay. weekend. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>